Hello and welcome to Note Doctors Summer Shorts. My name is Paul. My name is Jen. My name is Ben. And we are your hosts. We are all university music theory instructors who are passionate about music theory and music theory instruction. In these short episodes, we will be sharing with each other and all of you musical examples and teaching tips covering a wide range of topics. So if you want to know more about music theory and the most effective and innovative ways to teach it, this is the podcast for you. Hello and welcome back to Note Doctor's Summer Shorts, where we get to talk about all things music theory, pedagogy, with just the three of us. And today we are talking about basic instruction. And we have three kind of topics that we're going to want to touch on today. Uh, but the thing about instruction and teaching is that, at least for me and probably for you, you too as well, most of our um, theory pedagogy training was not in basic teaching or instruction techniques, right? It was, you know, understanding solfege or understanding these principles and maybe being able to teach them, but certainly not knowing how to handle a class or create a lesson plan or try to accommodate our students who have different types of needs. And so we're going to talk about those three things today because um, our hunches, probably some of our listeners didn't get that either, right? <laughs> Probably, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And so let's let's talk about the first our first topic and this is a big one cuz we're in the 2100s. What are what is this decade called? <laughs> the 2000s? 2000s. For this decade, the 2020s? The 2020s. There we go. <laughs> we're recording this the really roaring early. 20s. The roaring 20s. And the roaring 20s are all about the cell phones and our students <laughs> are always on their cell phones. And so how do we deal with that? Um, you know, we, 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 you, we don't want to be like the hardcore, you know, um, teacher who's mean and things like that. Or maybe we do. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but how do we manage? How do we, I th- how do we manage, um, you know, our students when they are distracted or they're pulling out their phones and things like that? And so what, do you, what are your takes? So I have a unique situation because my university prohibits cell phones in the classroom. There's like a blanket policy in every syllabus that says that students are not to have their devices out in the classroom unless the teacher has instructed them to for a classroom activity. So like if you do a Kahoot or something, of course, they're going to have their phones out. Um, So I've always had kind of like a three-step process that has always worked until this semester. So I'm excited to hear what other people do or think about this. But prior to the semester, step one is I would say, I should not see any cell phones. And that's usually all I ever have to say. Now I will say I have lovely students. They're rarely, if ever, combative. But... Typically, if I said that, whoever it is, is like really embarrassed and puts their phone away because they realize that I have seen them. Mm -hmm. The second time, if it's still happening, I will say, I still see a cell phone and I will call you out by name if you do not put it away right now. That. That was your teacher voice, Jen. I know, right? Yeah. That has almost always worked. And then the third step is to tell the student, you know, student. I still see you on a cell phone. (laughs) Put it away now or I will mark you absent. Right. I've only ever had to get to step three once and it didn't work. Student. Yeah, that was this semester. Student was like, but it's my mom. Uh, And I was like, tell your mom that you are in class. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. Oh, my. You had to write the response for student, didn't you? It, 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 yeah, it escalated quickly. And I still don't think the student put it away. And I said, okay, you're officially absent. You can decide whether you stay or go. And I don't ever like getting to that point with students. Uh-huh. Like, that is just not my normal MO. I prefer zero conflict in the classroom. We covered mm-hmm. that in the last one. The last <laughs> No Doctor Summer Short. Not a conflict fan. <clears throat> and I also don't, I don't like being like the enforcer. And I know of people who don't care. They're like, if the students are on their phones, so what? I'm not right. their mom. I'm not their, like, I'm not in charge of their life, whatever. Mm-hmm. 
Ben, you have gigantic classes. So yes. there's, I mean, what are you going to do about it other than just keep them really engaged and that has to be enough. I don't know. Yeah, that's kind of my approach. I have two kind of approaches, I would say, and this doesn't cover everything. I don't have like a, a certain more scripted kind of response like you do, Jen, but I am really clear from the beginning of the class that I have three kind of rules, which is effort, attitude, and respect. And I basically go through and I ask students, how much does it cost to have a good attitude? You know, and I'll tell them, you're on a, you're on a full scholarship today to give your 100% best effort. I called the president and said, he's told me that you're on a full scholarship to give a 100% best effort. So it's kind of a little shtick that I do, but it actually gets them to realize that I'm invested in them and then they have to then invest in me and what does it mean to actually give your best effort in any given day well it means like giving me eye contact it means like when I am talking and really delivering that you know crucial moment you should be eye contacting me and you should be ready to do music at any time and that kind of ties into the second one which is I have so much music making and responding in my class. Yeah. Like even when I'm talking about interval, I'm having them actually hold up an interval. I'm having them take your first finger and point to the spot on the music or make the interval larger or smaller or let's sing this. Can you sing this melody? Can you sing this bass line? Can you, let's start, can you give this third of the class, can you give me do? This third of the class, can you give me me? This third of the class, can you give me so? And let's manipulate that. Or I'm constantly working in activities where they're responding to my questions with as much music as possible. Mm -hmm. And that really helps because a lot of times you'll see somebody on their phone and I'll, I'll I won't be able to like really call them out because I'm in the middle of my lecture and it's like 100 right. more people. But mm -hmm. if I get them to do something musical, then they'll look up and they'll participate in that activity and it kind of brings them right. back in for a second. Mm -hmm. So there's no way that I could ever get every cell phone eliminated or, uh, you know, no. prevent them from checking their phones. But I think overall, I can pull them back in. And if I show that I care a lot and they understand that, then they are willing to put them away. Yeah, I think it's interesting because when I've taught, like I taught at UNT for a little bit and I've taught some of those huge classes and I felt similarly, like if I keep them engaged, most of them are not on their phones. If some of them are, it is what it is. I think what's because my classes are like 15 people, mm -hmm. like I see in great detail everyone who's ignoring me. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> I don't uh -huh. want to take it personally, but sometimes it's hard. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes yeah. it's hard to not be like, I'm working hard up here. What are you doing? <laughs> you know? Yep, totally. Oh. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. That's like where the respect thing comes in. It's like, well, exactly. I respect you enough to put this mm -hmm. really nice lesson together. Like, do you respect me enough to like actually engage with it? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I sometimes I'm sarcastic because I'll just be like, free yourself from the bonds of that cell phone. <laughs> like for these 50 minutes or however long, <laughs> release yourself, you know, from this these shackles that you have placed upon yourself and put those phone, that phone away, feel the release, feel the freedom that you're going to have in the next 50 minutes or whatever, where you're not having to be tethered to that phone. Um, but I think it's interesting, Jen, how, you know, your, your student was saying how they're texting their parent. And that makes me, that reminds me of my wife's interactions with her middle school students right and i'm yes. sure ben your emily's as well is where yeah. you know and those students become high schoolers and now they're becoming college students mm -hmm. and so the relationship to their parents or their the, the contact that they're able to have and what they feel is necessary mm -hmm. is is very different i think um so yeah of course i have to text my mom or text whoever you know because they need they need to know this or things like that so it's very different um but i think just like like just being okay with just that short redirect. And I'm sorry, Jen, that you had that uncomfortable situation. <laughs> because, because most of the time that little redirection is all they need. Yeah. And I feel like part of that is, is now that I'm like a, a dad with like preteens, like mm. I'm totally fine with being like, you know, like student, 
I need you to put that phone away. And then just going right back into it. Like, it yep. doesn't have to be a big thing. Yeah. Exactly. You just look at them. You, you say what you expect them to do. And, and 96% of the time, yep. you know, they're going to be like, oh, okay. And you may even get, like, a really, really, like, apologetic email later that day. Like, I'm so sorry, yes. you know. Um, that's, yeah. That happens. But I think it's, it doesn't have to be a big deal. Um, that you can just make that I redirection think, and then and then keep on going. Right. I think because my university has a policy, that's tricky too because it's like you feel like, well, if I'm not enforcing it, I'm not being fair to all the other faculty who are trying mm. to enforce this policy, right? right? And like you said, 96% of the time, it's like, I, it's mid-sentence. I'll be like, now, yeah. when you're forming an interval, you have to determine both the size and the quality. I shouldn't see any cell phones. The size, <laughs> you know, I mean, like, it's usually, yeah. uh -huh. you know, right. just kind of, and then they're like, oh, you know, uh -huh. rushing yeah. to put them away or whatever. I mean, like you said, most of the time, they are they feel embarrassed that they were caught or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's very rare to have that sort of, you know, yeah. more combative I, interaction. And let's be fair. You're going to have students who are more combative. We've all had yep. a mm -hmm. few. And that's going to that's part of classroom management too is figuring out like what do you do if mm -hmm. a student starts to really say like no, I'm the boss of this moment, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's much more right. rare in college, but yeah. you know, you can't lose total control of your classroom either. Mm -mm. No. So, well, I, don't I mean, know. yeah, I mean maybe that's like you have a chat with them after class because maybe yeah. it was something where like I'm texting my mom because my mom is, you know, in the hospital waiting room because my dad is in surgery. Or, like, you know, so like, right. There could be a lot of extenuating circumstances. And so I think like a conversation with that student, I don't think is not out of bounds. If you right. feel like they've been disrespectful or they're not, they're not meeting your expectations because you know, right. maybe maybe they don't understand, you know, what, what your expectations are, or maybe the situation was unusual. Was this, is this, not to get into the student's life too much, but was this student <laughs> normally like that, or was this kind of just a one-off kind of thing? Yeah, and I actually asked, I said, if it's an emergency, please step outside. Like, step mm -hmm. outside the room and handle whatever emergency this is. The student said, it's not an emergency. My mom just asked, you know, if I got up today. Okay, well... <laughs> <laughs> and Absent. yes, yes, this student was frequently or commonly both unengaged, non-participatory, and yeah. would cast kind of a shadow or a gloom over whatever mm -hmm. activity we were trying to do. It was fairly mm -hmm. common. Um, so, yeah. Do you guys ever just go in the area of the person that's on their phone? Yep. Yep. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. I just Physical yeah. proximity. That too. Yeah, with, uh -huh. with the yes. iPad, it's great because I'm so yep. much more mobile. Yeah. And you can mm -hmm. just go over there and then start teaching from their kind of section of the room. And then uh -huh. all of a sudden, the mm -hmm. phones start to go away. You know, That's maybe right. the people in the front then pull out the phone. You have to go back to the front. But... <laughs> Fortunately, with 15, I can be kind of like right in the middle of them. Uh -huh. I'm by all of them. Yeah. Right? If I just move away from the podium and I'm in the middle of the room, yeah, I'm close to everybody so you got, yeah. got good proximity yeah. to the whole class that's pretty cool <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah that's that's a that's a good trick because the, they, they notice because they also know that mm -hmm. you know i'm probably not supposed to be on my phone right now and mm -hmm. and so yeah but all right well there we go classroom management cell phones <laughs> solved <laughs> all right. well let's talk about uh another topic that I don't think we, I really learned much about in uh, my theory of pedagogy classes, and that's lesson planning. Uh, specifically, mm -hmm. you know, how do you pace a lesson? Um, how much time do you give to you know, responding to students' questions or reviewing? Um, how much winging it is is in your lesson plan? <laughs> you know, um, I mean, I can speak for myself. I I was cleaning up my. Um, a desktop folder or something from when I was an adjunct and I had these d very detailed lesson plans for every oral skills class I taught this is when I was I think a DBU mm -hmm. and I mean I had like time like five minute do this you know ten mm -hmm. minutes do this all these things like that um, 
and I don't do that anymore. No. Um, I, <laughs> I certainly I, I'm not I'm not writing down how long I think these uh, these things should take. Um, but I still do have lesson plans and kind of a schedule and these types of um, uh, plan that I, I that I want to make. But it's not necessarily all written down as like, you know this is what I want to do. Um, and I think it's also based on experience and also our different um, uh, kind of situations. So I teach an hour and 20 minute long theory class mm -hmm. and that's uh, Monday and Wednesday. And that's a pretty long time to teach, you mm -hmm. know, I don't know, uh, borrowed chords or something like that. Um, and so the pacing is crucial with that, with any, with any uh, type of class. But especially yes. with you, when you're with their with your when you're with them for an hour and twenty minutes, mm -hmm. you can't just be, you know, going through powerpoints or talking about musical examples without doing any activities. So it's really about finding that those times to to mix it up and think about okay, how long is too long to be really <laughs> talking, and then we need to move on to something else. What do, what are your thoughts on those things? Yeah, I I definitely can and do like quote unquote wing it more now, but usually if I'm winging it, it's because the students are either behind or ahead of where I thought they would be. So I introduce mm -hmm. something and they're all like, we all already know everything about secondary dominance. So then I'm probably on a different path than I originally planned if I thought that half the room had never heard of them, you know? Mm -hmm. um, or I walk in and I'm thinking like, we've already done this several times. So it's going to be great. We'll just do a quick review and then we start to review and it's all falling apart and they don't know anything. I'm probably winging it because, you know, they're not where I thought they were. Um, I also used to write detailed lesson plans with timings and everything, and I don't do that anymore, but I still lesson plan. I do it now in a like a big grid. So if it's a Monday, Wednesday, Friday class, it has kind of like three columns for Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And that way I can easily, um, I make Fridays the lightest so that I can keep shifting forward if there's a concept that needs more work or if I have the ability to like throw in extra. I'll always have kind of like a buffer thing. Like if we get through all of this and they're doing great, we could also tackle this on Friday, you know, or whatever. Um, but I, some of it too is learning your own style. I'm a very lecture light um, teacher. I lecture, my goal is never to lecture for more than 10 minutes. And most of the time, if I'm talking to them and it's just me talking and them listening, it's like five to seven minutes max. And then we're doing it, right? So like I'm explaining a thing maybe for a little bit, but then we're all doing whatever that thing is for several minutes. So there's a lot more doing time in my classes than there is talking time. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, I, I think the show don't tell, like that's a, like mm -hmm. a, a story. Like if you're writing a story, that's like a, a rule, right. Or um, anything where uh, making a, a film, right. You don't tell, they don't tell the audience that you're brave or the, the hero is brave or the, 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 the villain is evil. Like I right. am evil. Like you show them being <laughs> evil, right. Or you show yes. them acting bravely. Right. And so, yeah, you can show them all you, or tell them all you want, but you gotta, mm -hmm. you gotta show it. And that means like listening, active participation. Uh, and I think that's a, that's a, trouble spot for a lot of younger or inexperienced yeah. teachers and i'm sure you deal with that a lot ben with your uh army of tfs is like they can just talk the whole way through and you're like where was the music you know you only listen to that one excerpt one time there is <laughs> no way they got yeah. all of that out all the things that you wanted out of that right yep yeah no i said that was my number one comment to kind of teacher feedback was like more music making because you can ask people a lot of questions you can say what was the solfege that you heard but why not just have them sing you know the more singing right. the more music making I, don't, I think that goes for both theory and RL skills class definitely uh, for sure because everybody's there ultimately because they enjoy some form of music making or music engagement of some kind mm-hmm 
and it just it brings everybody back to um, when, when you do that. Um, I would say the biggest difference for me when I first started lesson planning, like Paul was saying, when I was adjuncting and things, to now is spending more time on the wrap up or the key the key takeaways for the mm-hmm. day. Like, what was it? If you want them to take away one thing from that day, make sure that you leave time. <clears throat> excuse me. Leave time at the end of the class period to go over that and really nail that home or give them something like, you know, on their hand or a little acronym or, you know, like, you know, PADMIL or like LIMDAP, if you do PADMIL or LIMDAP right. for modes <laughs> or whatever that like thing is, leave time in the lesson for that because you really want them to come back the next class period and then say, okay, back on Tuesday, what do we do? And then they'll boom, LIMDAP, oh yeah, right? And then you kind of have that... Mm-hmm linkage between class periods that I think I really neglected when I first started teaching. I was more like, okay, I covered this, okay, and I covered this, and I did this particular sight singing, and it had some modal mixture, okay, they've got it, you know, versus like really like spending five minutes at the end to wrap it up and like hit home, like what exactly did we do today, and then starting out the next period with that. I'm terrible at that. <laughs> I am like I run right up to the time and then right, I'm like right. you know uh, don't forget blah, 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 you know like right before they're walking out the door in fact when I went up for full professor that was the one thing that they said like everyone said on my teaching evaluations was like oh this class was so fun I was so engaged I really learned a lot also you don't close like you just end <laughs> and I'm like mm-hmm. yeah I know yeah because you have the things you want to teach and you're like okay there's <laughs> yeah. the class period but then if you leave five minutes at the end, I think it does really help. And I'm like faced with the fact that a lot of my students will not ask a question, even though they have it, because they don't want to, you mm-hmm. know, interrupt the the time of of a hundred other people, and they're too embarrassed to raise their hand in front of a hundred mm-hmm. other people. And you know, I will always use handouts, and I'll have them mark up the handouts with me, and then post that handout. So the the ones that didn't Sorry. ask a question will go back through and be able to look at that answer and it has those kind of objectives and takeaways at the at the beginning and end yeah. i know that wouldn't be super applicable like maybe in your case jen it's probably less applicable because chances are they just ask their question <laughs> in the yeah, moment yeah probably yeah yeah mm-hmm. yeah so here's a, another sort of lesson plan question do you i know people who just like use last fall's lesson again and they do that for their whole career. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's so not what I do. Like every class that every theory one I've taught was a different theory one. Like it's it's never the same. I'm always tweaking it and changing it. It's probably harder for me, I guess. But yeah, more satisfying. I, mean, I have I have a Google Doc which has for every every class that I teach and I'll have every day. Yeah, that's... and for 15 weeks. And I and I refer back to that because I mean I, I might change some orderings and things like that, but that helps to re- I hel- helps me remember good things that I did. Yeah, like oh, yeah, I that, usually that start... musical example, right? Yeah, or um, you know this activity, and I'll put in notes, or I'll be like, okay, this had to move down. Um, so I do have something that I go back to if I'm teaching the same class. Um, but it's never, never the same. Cause I'm yeah. like, oh, I always that... start from yeah. last year. Mm-hmm. Like the last time yeah. I did it, I start from that and then I'm, you know, kind of tweaking as mm-hmm. I go. But yeah, I'm also not a written, I know people who type, like type out oh. their whole lecture and are I, like, I don't low do key that. reading that. Definitely oh. not me. It's like a list. Of, I don't think I yeah. could. No, I don't, I couldn't either. Terrible. Yeah. I, don't, I wouldn't know. Hmm. Mm-mm. No. But I can see that. It's super organized, yeah. but wow. Like if you were teaching me music history or something like that, like I might be more inclined, yeah. but yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I'm sometimes write will write down out. so I don't leave it out. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, that's fine. And like if I want to make sure I get the wording right on something, you know, there's a very technical way of saying something. Yes. Um, I, I want to make sure I, I write that down so that I kind of have access to it. One yeah. of the things that I struggle with is my um, activities getting out of hand and taking longer than I expected. Because I like to do, you know, like these little composition projects or, you Mm -hmm. know, these things in class. 
and I'm looking at the clock. I'm like, oh, I only have 15 minutes. Can I do it? Can I get like, get this thing in? <laughs> um, and so sometimes I, I run into that problem where I, 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 I'm just trying to put – if I would have given myself more time, I could have had a better experience with this type of a pro, a little kind of in-class project. Um, Because I think those are super valuable. Um, Again, it's about getting Mm -hmm. them doing things. But that does take time out of, you know, uh, instruction or giving them the, these, you know, the takeaways even too. Um, Like, okay, well, we just played through your little recomposition projects and we're out of time. So see you later. Um, So have the same problem as you do, Jen, (laughs) with with that type of situation. Yeah. It's usually because we're like, yeah, we're improving on the keyboards. We're like creating a modal melody or something, and then I'm like, shoot, we have like 30 seconds left. Right. <laughs> so there's no time for pad mill. <laughs> You're gonna end on the lowered two. You're like screaming as they go, pad mill, as they pad go out mill. the door. <laughs> oh my. Well, yeah. I mean, I th- yeah. <laughs> So that's, that's lesson planning. And I think that's something that as you go, it, it, it becomes easier, I think, because you get a sense of yeah. the room too. It's like, all right, oh, this yeah. is, we've reached critical mass with this, with whatever we're doing now, we've got to move on to something else and let's, let's go on to that thing. And having, I guess, extra things ready, you know, in case mm-hmm. things go faster or things mm-hmm. go slower, then you can push things away. But I found that having you know the well, little little extra thing in the bag is often helpful if you have have a little more time totally. anticipated. Well, let's let's talk about our last thing, and that is um, Office of Disability and Accommodation. So we all um, have students that have the, have different um, maybe disabilities or uh, ways of learning and. We have to accommodate for those, and that can be in the theory or the oral skills classroom. I think, at least for me, it's a little more challenging uh, in an oral skills setting uh, because right. music theory, you know, okay, they can take longer on a test or a skill drill. It's a little bit harder with oral skills when they're having to listen to things. And so the question is, well, I guess we'll say one of the most common accommodations is more time. So like right. time and a half or double the time. Um, so does that equal more hearings uh, for, for, for you all? It doesn't for me. I okay. just, so essentially if a student, and of course, in our case, it's not like K-12, where if there's an accommodation, you have to make it and you have to arrange for it and all of that. In college, the students have to ask for it. And, you know, I don't, I want to help them. So if I have a student who I think, I know they have an accommodation and they're not asking for it. I might say like, Hey, if you want extra time, you know, let me know and we'll make an arrangement. Um, but if I have a student ask for extra time on dictation, I basically give them the exam on my own, like just the two of us. And I give them unlimited time between hearings. So they have the same number of hearings as everyone else but they can take as long in between the hearings as they need. Um, Hmm. That in general has worked pretty well until I had a student who has an actual um, like sound perception disability where they actually, like there was an accommodation that I've had that was like, this person needs to hear things more than other people. So then I was like, well, that obviously means more hearings, you know, like to me, that's an obvious. Yeah. yeah. That's nice that they wrote that out to you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That way you were able to make that decision. more. more Yeah. That accommodation actually came from an audiologist, which was interesting. Hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Usually you don't get, I feel like enough information to make the decision as far as number of plays or is it just the time in between the plays, say for right. dictation, or even for just a sight reading, you know, more time to prepare that mm-hmm. particular sight reading exactly. melody. But I don't know. I kind of have defaulted to asking the student if you're comfortable discussing 
some more details of how we can help you. Yeah. What is it that, you know, what part of it is slowing you down? Is it just the hearing part and internalizing, or is it more of that process of actually notating that slows you down? And most of the time, a student is perfectly comfortable, and they know that you're in it to ultimately help them, right. like you said, Jen. And if they know that, they say, well, you know, for me, it's more of the writing, or you try to read some more of the other um, things in their letter from ODA and say, you know, tell me about your differently abled abilities and right. uh, tell well, us how to help you best. In K-12, you know what the situation is. Like, you're told that right. <laughs> in mm-hmm. K-12. Yeah. Um, at least when I was doing student teaching long ago, like, if we had students with accommodations in the room, we knew what they were and why, right? Obviously, in college, you just get this list that's like, the student needs to be able to sit in the front of the room and eat food and record you. You're like, okay. There you go. I don't know. Burritos or Cheetos. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Hopefully some of that's not too crunchy. (laughs) It's always crunchy, though. Why is that? (laughs) It's another topic. That's funny. Well, I've always actually interpreted it as more hearings. And so Mm -hmm. if, um, so say a student would normally get six hearings in uh, an exam setting i'll have them do nine and so um either it sometimes it has to be you know at a different time but usually i'm able to either meet with them like i don't know 20 minutes before class or maybe 20 minutes after class they just stick around Mm -hmm. and then we can do the additional hearings that way i have had sometimes students need to be in the testing center Mm-hmm. And then yeah. so so then you have to create the 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 dictations, you know, uh, recordings and send them to uh, uh, the, the 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 testing center. And so that that usually works. Um, that's how I usually have done it um, because it is. But I've not, I've never actually asked, you know, well, is it do you need more time between or is it do you, you need more hearings? Um, and so I don't know. Right, because if you so you're giving them nine hearings. Yeah. But like if you're still controlling the amount of time in between each of those, like maybe right. what they actually need is more time. I don't know. Well, I but like, that does take that takes time that takes more time to do it too. Of course. So it kind of right. <laughs> right. Yeah, you do kind of get time and a half by playing right. You get time more and a half. Yeah. And right. Like, yeah. Right. Yeah. But it's just a different way of spending the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I don't know. It's a tricky one. And I think, I think sometimes students also don't know, like I've had students who are like, well, you know that I have X, Y, Z. And I'm like, no, I right. do now. Uh, you're, you don't have to disclose that. And <laughs> right. I'm not supposed to ask that. Right. Yeah. Right. I don't think, uh-huh. I think like a lot of, they're probably told how this works in college. I'm sure they are. Mm-hmm. But like if they had accommodations in high school, a lot of times they think it works exactly the same way. And of course it doesn't. Right. Um, so mm-hmm. I've had students get very angry if I didn't automatically give them, you know, time and a half on a test. And I'm like, you are supposed to ask and arrange that yourself, mm-hmm. you know? So, yeah, it's a tricky thing. But obviously what we all want is our students to be successful. And right. if there's some sort of accommodation, that means that that's what they need to, mm-hmm. to do that, you know? Yeah. So. It's figuring out. It's more of a puzzle, I think, sometimes for us mm-hmm. than for our K-12 colleagues. Yeah. And the real challenge is when you have students who have some type of disability but don't have an accommodation. Yes. And there's a lot of that, too. Yes. There's a lot of that where you're like, please go to the <laughs> ODA yeah. because they can help you, but I can't technically do anything um, until I have that you know, you know, notification. And so that can be sometimes frustrating because those students clearly have something that is kind of keeping them from being as successful, but we don't have the, we don't have the paperwork to make that type of accommodation. It's really common where I'm at in part because I have probably, I'm guessing a larger population of homeschooled students than you have Mm -hmm. at your state universities. Mm -hmm. And so homeschooled students are just naturally receiving accommodations from their parents. Um, That's just kind of part of how that works, you know? So a lot of times they 
they maybe don't even really realize they have something they Mm -hmm. need help with or something because they haven't been in a traditional classroom setting or not as frequently um, as their other peers. Yeah. I've had a student tell me it was after they had already gone through all of our skills, things like that. They're like, I think I have a disability, but I never, never knew. (laughs) And they also had, you know, they were homeschooled. And so, yeah, a, a, a similar situation there, but, we want our students to be successful, and so we want to do what we can to do that, right? Yeah. yeah. I've also yeah. had students who don't want to use their accommodations. Have you run into that? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which is interesting. Mm-hmm. And about. fine. I mean, mm-hmm. yeah. in some cases, I've been like, yeah, you, you haven't seemed to need it thus far. You know, like if mm-hmm. it's time and a half, for example, and but music theory comes really naturally to them. You know, I'm like, yeah, I mean, you're usually done before everyone else. So, you Mm -hmm. know, maybe you don't. Yeah. Maybe you don't need it. I don't know. Yeah. It's an interesting thing. Yeah. Case by case. And I think it's something that's only going to continue to uh, to grow as we continue on. So I have to be mindful of it. All right. Well, friends, I think we've reached the end of our time talking about some of those things that we didn't talk about in theory school. And that's our classroom management, (laughs) cell phones, lesson planning and those accommodations for our students. So thank you so much for listening and we'll be back with another summer short. You just made it to the end of another episode of Note Doctors, the music theory and pedagogy podcast. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and review the podcast. And you can always reach us at notedoctorspodcast at gmail.com with comments, questions, or show ideas. Thanks for listening.